are on. All right, so we're going to wait a little more. We have, yeah, one person, David Drake. We're going to start at 3.30 sharp because, again, 45 minutes, not a lot of Right. Yeah. within the group um, sure. and whoever is going to come. By the way, harasses, again, the structure is people come in and people go. We may have one person, we may have 10 people, and then goes down to three, so it will change. Yeah. So let's wait one more minute, and then I'm going to get started. We are having winter weather, Karen, in the East Coast. How about you? Um, well, it's not too bad, but uh, I think tomorrow is going to probably snow uh, even in the valley. So, but it, um, yeah. it's... Some snow. Today Some was snow. a very good day, but uh, I was inside all the time. <laughs> It's a shame. I see my Paul, my good friend Paul Sheard from S and P days has joined. He's at Harvard. That's uh, he's a All great right. guy. He was That's a chief he was a chief economist at at uh, S and P. Very good. So maybe we should start. What say you, panelists and audience? I think, given the time, I think we should start. Uh, good afternoon from Washington D.C. A cold Washington D.C. Uh, we're very happy to be here to talk about a very important issue, that's sustainability. Back to basics, because we keep coming back to this issue all the time. I am going to introduce myself first. My name is Sarohan Atipolu. I'm the CEO of Business Environment Risk Intelligence. It's a sovereign country risk analysis group uh, based in Washington, D.C. Um, I had the pleasure for the past three weeks uh, doing two dry runs with some and one dry run with the other uh, panelists, and we did talk about the issues. I think you're in for a really interactive, uh, engaging uh, discussion on the debt issue. But And we're going to talk about different parts of it. Of course, we're going to talk about the pandemic and how it has um, exacerbated the debt issues for a lot of countries. We're going to, These are the short-term issues. And then we're going to look at long-term issues as well. And those long-term issues will range from public-private partnership to foster innovation and how we can actually um, maybe rein in and, and take control of this issue so that the debt sustainability becomes easier to manage maybe in five, 10 years from now, because what we're facing right now is truly um, a, a very difficult situation. So we come back to the table on this topic, right? The debt, we, we define it, we try to define it. Maybe Keynes said it best when he said, if I owe you a pound, it's my problem. If I owe you a million pounds, the problem is yours. I think that's a great way of, of <laughs> defining what debt is without using the word debt. And then Earl Wilson, who is a journalist, once said, you know, there are three kinds of people. There are the um, have people here. There are the have nots. And then there are the have people who have not paid for they have. So have not people who they have not paid. That's the third kind. So that is another definition of debt. Right. So anyway, bringing it back to the issues here, we're going to talk about emerging market debt quite a bit. And uh, also, I'm going to say a couple of things about developed country debt, because that has become an issue, not because of the pandemic only, but since 2008, that great financial recession uh, in the United States. Right now, the fiscal deficit is about to hit five trillion dollars. The federal debt is 130 uh, percent of GDP. It has increased 15 trillion in just 12 years from the end of the financial crisis, 2008, to this day. So we do have issues here, too, to the point that some of my clients say, hey, you know what, Sarahan? I think this issue is more important in developed countries than emerging markets. I say no to them. But then they say, why do you say no? Look at the GDP contra contraction. G7 average contraction is 5.7%. And if you look at the developed countries, it's 3.3%. Mm. Well, how about the informal economy? Right? That's something that we're going to touch upon too. A quarter of the GDP activity in Asia, Africa, Latin America, 50% of 
of labor market, labor force, is in the informal mm -hmm. activity or informal sector. And that's not covered by the numbers until when? Until their governments come in and spend to take care of macroeconomic imbalances, which is going to make things far worse for emerging markets and develop con developing countries. With that all said, I'm not going to talk more. I'm going to start asking the panelists what they think about this debt issue. And Mahesh, I'm going to have you go first. Uh, please introduce yourself a little bit, and then the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sir Rohan. Uh, I'm very pleased to join this uh, <coughs> uh, conference for the first time. Um, and uh, uh, your lead-in is very interesting because you talk about the short-term and the long-term. And um, the uh, talk I have is about the short term that should uh, become the long term. Uh, my background <coughs> is in uh, uh, credit ratings. Um, I spent a decade at Standard & Poor's um, rating countries outside the U.S. Uh, and borrowers outside the U.S. Um, then I spent uh, time in investment banking and in financial guarantee industry. And I've been an advisor on ratings for the last two decades. So my talk is about the highly indebted countries in Africa and elsewhere in the emerging markets who have been hit by the coronavirus situation worse than, than we can imagine. So uh, it, uh, two decades ago or even a Last October, Zambia defaulted. Uh, S&P and Fitch cut the rating of the country to uh, default and Moody's to CA, which is near default. This shut down Zambia's access to the eurobond markets completely. Zambia was not alone. Others defaulting in 2020 included Ecuador, Lebanon, Argentina, and Suriname, whose president just spoke a few uh, hours ago at this, count, at this meeting. Um, nearly a dozen other countries could follow suit as they are in high debt distress, according to the IMF and Fitch. Uh, these include Cameroon, Ethiopia, Ghana, Kenya, Laos, uh, Re Republic of the Congo, and Mozambique, among others. A year ago, the G20, in its wisdom, initiated a program called the Debt Service Suspension Initiative, DSSI. They offered under it a suspension, not a forgiveness, of up to $12 billion in official debt service due last year. About 46 of the 73 countries eligible for this aid took up the offer, and they received $5 billion in official debt service that is less than a half of what was offered. Three countries are now seeking debt relief under son of DC, DSSI, a program called the Common Framework, which was put in place in November, uh, and those three are Zambia, Chad, and Ethiopia. Kenya actually thought it might borrow under, uh, seek debt relief under the common framework, but backed away because the unfortunate thing is that the common framework G20 put in place requires the country to default on private debt before it can get debt relief from the public sector. This is not a great idea. Um, so, uh, the G20 initiatives uh, from last year were extended for this year to 2021, and the two programs, in still my, in my view, are just not enough. First, no economist expects the G GDP of uh, even the U.S. to return uh, to the levels of pre-pandemic, let alone the GDPs of Africa and Latin America or other emerging market countries. Second, Private investors are not likely to participate in debt service suspension voluntarily as the common framework con contemplates and as was seen in the case of Zambia, where the private sector declined to participate. Third, China also contributed uh, to uh, the Zambian default because Eurobond investors decided not to provide debt relief because Chinese policy banks, 100% state-owned, uh, were deemed to be private sector by the Chinese, even though they are 100% owned by the government. So they were paid, and the private sector said on Eurobonds, we will not forgive 
or delay interest unless the Chinese are treated the same way in the prior. Fourth, while the G20's common framework envisages its Chinese participation, it is unclear whether the Chinese will in fact do so and to what extent. Their participation has been lacking transparency. Fifth, the common framework virtually requires, as I said, the country to default before it can get debt relief. And finally, middle-income countries do not qualify under either of the uh, G20 programs. So where are we? We are in a slow-moving train wreck in process. Countries with liquidity, prob liquidity problems are increasingly facing insolvency. This is due to the pandemic's economic stress, rising poverty, and declining investment. The poorest countries are the most at risk. We need not just debt service suspension, but longer maturities and lower interest rates to make the debt affordable and the countries solvent. How do we do this? Well, let us remember that in the 80s, Brady plan was used for the Latin American debt crisis. Then the new Brady bonds were issued with zero coupon U.S. Treasury securities that guaranteed repayment of principal to the lenders. This allowed them to stretch out maturities and lower interest rates. Today, we must do the same with similar so-called Yellen bonds, which is my name for them, or Kristalina bonds if IMF decides to pay for them. We can use them to maintain private capital market access at affordable interest rates. Yellen bonds, like their Brady bond predecessors, would guarantee ultimate repayment with U.S. Treasury or other AAA-rated securities, um, which, given low interest rates, would would cost more to buy today than they they would have in they did in the 80s, because interest rates were then were higher and the cost of zeros lower. But the cost of such credit enhancement in the form of the zero coupon bonds or similar securities that would defease the principal is nothing compared to the trillions already spent globally to address the pandemic. The costs of inaction on the debt of the poor countries are rising. Already, more than 50 million Africans have been pushed into poverty last year. I heard the uh, president of Suriname, or I think one of the speakers said that the poverty levels in Latin America have topped 200 million. And in Africa, the number will the additional poverty numbers will double this year to 100 million. That's incremental poverty, not the total. Total is much higher. Poverty has increased also elsewhere. Furthermore, uh, poverty raises social tensions, threatens security, political instability, and risks terrorism. These, there is also a risk of collapsing African healthcare systems, failing to halt the pandemic, spawning further mutations, and variations and breeding another pandemic. As you know, Ebola is rearing its ugly head again. Uh, so we must provide better relief on debt for the heavily indebted African countries and do so today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mahesh, for that uh, really interesting idea. Again, back to the future, going back to these things where they were actually utilized very successfully. And I think I agree with you that we're facing a situation where um, something needs to be done, better organized and um, addressing the issue. So thank you very much. We're going to come back to that and we're going to ask the audience to, of course, to jump in and ask questions or make comments during this. But I want to turn to Arun right now because Arun says charity begins at home, kind of, don't you, Arun, in terms of how to approach uh, this issue. Please, the floor is yours. Sure. Thank you. So just for by way of quick introduction, I now run a global advisory practice of my own after uh, stepping down as the chief investment officer at IFC, uh, where I spent a very long time working uh, across the globe with a number of countries. And, uh, uh, you know, and the result of all that was that I've seen this movie multiple times now, uh, the, the, the debt crisis. I've lived through many, uh, you know, the Latin American debt crisis, the debt crisis in 97 Asia, which my friend Mahesh also you know, bore the brunt off in, in various ways. And uh, and then uh, also in Russia and, and Argentina and uh, Turkey, among other countries in the late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, and, and these episodes have been continuing. And uh, so over the years, one has learned uh, a number of lessons. Uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, you know, but, but it, so I think it's useful as we contemplate this situation 
which has been you know quite uh, well described by you Sarwan and Mahesh in the African context uh, the, the you know we have uh, we've have, we have been there done that before we have gotten into trouble before we've gotten out of trouble and we are back in trouble and I think we will continue to do so but in that process uh, we have learned I think some important lessons so I think the construction of solutions uh, <laughs> although some solutions are already on the table but I think, you know, if we are going to do a new initiative like the, along the lines of what Mahesh is suggesting, where you have, you know, a AAA uh, or a very strong creditor underwriting the resumption of lending to some of these markets, you know, there needs to be, I think, you know, some very good conditionality and enforceable conditionality, you know, accompanying that, uh, you know, that type of instrument or that type of initiative. And it can be, a range of initiatives is so that are possible, but I think what is what is very important, at least from my perspective, is that any construct that is that is launched with with a view to addressing this immediate and I would say very very pressing problem, you know, has to take into account, you know, what the lessons are, and there's a lot of lot of literature, a lot of research, a lot of uh, uh, you know scholarly papers. But the actual lessons are, you know, not not that uh, rocket science, and they're they're fairly basic. And uh, in the end, I'll tell you. I mean, I can, you know, what I would conclude with that, you know, the problem of of long term unsustainable debt is a governance issue. Uh, in the end, if you ask me, what is the what is the real issue? <clears throat> the real issue is that it's a governance issue, and and this is true both for public sector debt and for private sector debt. But let me not jump into that right now. Uh, and let's just talk a few minutes about what have we learned over these years, you know, because this is not the first time that the world is facing a multi-country, multi-region debt issue. Uh, we've done this before. The actors are different, the regions are different, you know, and one of the reasons actors are different is the last time these four others, the Africa was not in trouble because they didn't have any access. Uh, you know, so Latin America had access, so they got into, so those who had access got into trouble. Now they, Africa got access, so they're, they're in trouble. And why are they in trouble? So what are the lessons? I think so. One of the first most important lessons is that you know, there, you know, any borrower, like, and that's true of an individual, of a company, or a country. You know, your your debt accumulation and your debt borrowing has to have a link to your ability to service it. So and. You know, unless you have a really plan on uh, how you're going to pay it back, you know, it's great to sign a hundred million bond deal rated by my friend Mahesh and, you know, sold in, uh, sold to Eurobond investors and, you know, uh, and putting some of Karen's pension money into it. Uh, but, you know, it's it's not very good if, uh, you know, you are not making any plans of, by the way, how you're going to repay. So that that's very, very important. Uh, that That has to be there. And a very big part of that ability to repay is the currency part. I mean, as I, as we were speaking earlier, uh, the fact that, uh, you know, the number of developed countries who have their bulk of their debt in uh, the currency of their uh, home country or, you know, a common currency like the euro, you know, have a, have a much easier time managing the debt because they don't have essentially the additional layer of FX pressure. On on organizing the debt service uh, because you essentially can, at least in theory, uh, you know, at the risk of debasing your currency, can at least print the money to to get to where you want to be, unless there are, of course, other policy or constitutional, uh, you know, obstacles to that. But by and large, uh, you know, many countries who have their debt in local currency have generally found the their ability to stave off default. Uh, you know, by with as compared to you know countries that have indebted des, themselves in a currency, not their own. Uh, then uh, I think the another very important lesson, and I think it is uh, not highlighted as much, but and I don't know how much work has been done on that. Some work has been done, I know, uh, but certainly to my mind, it's a very important lesson, which is how is this debt used? I mean, net by by definition, you know, is not bad. Uh, you know, it, you know, there are countries who are at different stages of development, and uh, you know, the conventional wisdom is that uh, you know, unless you get supplemental resources to supplement your domestic savings, 
you will be caught into you know various traps that the economists have coined various wonderful terms for which i'm not that familiar with but uh, it's very clear that the uh, you know the ability to need uh, need to borrow for productive investment is a, is a pretty generic uh, and i would say well understood uh, concept and i think a fairly consensus concept because uh, you know that's what uh, you know even private sector do all of us do all of us take a mortgage to buy a house uh, and we take debt uh, in order to create a productive asset and so do companies and so do countries but the fact is that you know it's the analogy is simple i mean taking a a, a large loan to finance drinking uh, in the pub or nice nice uh, seller of wine uh, as opposed to you know getting a putting that debt into a business and earning some money from it you know they they have very different economic consequences and that's that's a lesson that is uh, you know i'm sure internally understood but not not very actively implemented then the other thing that's very important in terms of managing this whole uh, debt debt issue because the debt issue is really dependent not only on the quantum of debt but also when it is coming due and in what form so if a lot of debt comes due at the same time you have a problem and 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 this uh, it's always better to see if you can st- term structure your debt in a way that is balanced uh, you know more or less better correlated with your ability to pay it is true that you know any country can uh, you know if it's a not in civil war or you know some really other catastrophic situation you know, eventually can catch up and find ways to raise revenues to make that money but it takes time so instead of not like right now buying time and term you know through these initiatives uh, it would be a lot better if you have uh, you know pay a little more interest but at least have uh, you know a longer term structure of your uh, your debt so uh, that's that's another important lesson uh, and then i think the link also again this is again a part of the whole debt service lesson uh, you know the link to external reserves you know how much really capacity do you have to pay off your foreign currency debt as reflected in your external reserves if we don't have any reserves and you keep borrowing debt you you're, you're creating a recipe for disaster and that's uh, you know on the side of the government debt now it is also important that private debt plays a very big part as well and uh, because you know a, a a private sector company borrowing in a particular country is not the liability of the government when it comes to the you know actual physical commercial repayment but it is the liability of the government to the extent that you have to find the foreign currency to pay it back and in fact that was a lot of the reason the ifc was always a very popular lender and a co-financier uh, for uh, because we had access or preference to whatever money the government had in terms of foreign currency and the fx allocation was became the main i would say factor rather than the solvency of the company most companies were solvent despite whatever external crisis were there especially the kind of companies you know we'd be lending to but they didn't have the dollars to pay us back and that was really creating a crisis and again you know if you don't pay back a foreign creditor your access to the market dries overnight so so again so that's that's a very important thing for countries to keep in mind is how much foreign debt are, is their private sector accumulating and a lot of countries you know have gone into trouble uh, without you know uh, realizing how much the uh, private debt has been accumulating on the one side and the other thing is that when you know, when it rains uh, it o- doesn't only rain it pours so the private debt very often you know can become public sector debt if these crises result in you know cut off of liquidity and therefore you're dependent or or you know you inability to refinance and then you have to bail out these banks and you have to take over lot you know a lot of financial institutions and then as again we have seen in some multiple countries so that's another very important thing to watch out for to what kind of uh, risk does is the government taking of having a you know having a private sector debt become uh, sorry public se- yeah become public sector debt and that really brings me to uh, the point that you know creating uh, the ability to a uh, uh, you know firstly avoid this kind of situation but also if it happens to deal with it is very important so you need to have very very, very good uh, you know firstly regulation and supervision of the financial system uh, clearly that's a, you know no brainer everybody you know nobody would argue with that 
But more important than that also is I think the ability to deal with, you know, bank restructuring, debt restructuring, insolvency regimes, all these things, you know, are boring and kind of nobody wants to, you know, dwell, dwell on them too much. But they are fundamental reasons for economic health. One of the reasons, you know, despite all the talk, the U.S. has you know, been a strong economic engine all these years. We can debate on its efficiency and success. But it has been a tremendous economic engine. And one of the reasons it has been, I think we're getting some input. Yeah, uh, we have some, some echoing going on. But at this point, Aaron, in the interest of time, I just want to ask the panelists uh, if there's any, because the two presentations kind of are related to one another. And Paul, uh, I'd like to bring you in here too, if you have any uh, comments that you want to make uh, before I, I pass it on to, to Karen uh, for the last presentation. You have, to, you have to grab the mic, Paul. Uh, you have to give him the mic. Uh, yeah, I did, I did. Great, great. Paul, Mike Paul, is yours. Paul, great to have you. Sorry. Yeah, no, Hi, sorry, I didn't. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, no, very, I'm just really listening very intently um, to this um, panel, and um, I'm sure it'll get much more coverage and uh, attention when it goes on YouTube. But uh, maybe, Mahesh, with your policy proposal for the, the Yell uh, Yellen bonds, um, What's the traction that you've been getting with that? Um, does yeah. Janet know about these? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if if you have a pipeline to her, please tell her. I I I don't know the answer to that because I haven't talked to her, nor do I. I used to work at the Fed, but under Volcker, not her her. So so I don't know the answer to that. But the traction is this: I've discussed it extensively with. Uh, uh, the Bretton Woods Committee, the uh, 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 Council, Atlantic Council, with the Corporate Council in Africa president and board members, a couple of board members. Uh, the USAID's private sector head, uh, team head knows about it. Um, uh, a number of other people have commented to me from around the markets. And, and, and what I hear is from everywhere, the idea makes sense. Uh, the idea uh, uh, that uh, I've talked to the head of the Economic Commission for for Africa, uh, uh, Vera Songwe. She she is very bright, and yeah, she has her own KFC. Uh, yes, uh, exactly. And she's got her own idea. But she said to me, "Let's forget my idea versus your idea. Let's look at the issue, which is getting credit enhancement." She has found some traction. She said to me from some. Asian and some European sources. Um, and uh, one of the groups that I talked to is going to talk to the U.S. Uh, government authorities, in particular DFC, where there is a lot of money um, with respect to the uh, uh, expansion of its capital that was carried out last year from 29 to 60 billion. So there is a possibility, but you know, you got to also find a country that deserves it and that will uh, address the issues that Arun raised of governance and how how they will actually go back to solvency um, uh, and how they will deploy the funds for purposes that make sense uh, that are the use of proceeds issue. Um, so that's there is limited traction. It is in train, and I'd like to recruit you to help. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and just, I mean, it's a little broadening out a little bit. I mean, this COVID crisis, you know, so far has been very much a developed world crisis. I mean, India, the numbers have got worse in, in India, but to a large extent, and particularly China, the numbers are incredibly low. Um, how do you think, I mean, how are you thinking about how COVID plays into this, particularly the longer, t the emerging market uh, debt situation? You know, could they, you know, emerge from this actually in a, in a relatively stronger situation because they have the growth potential they also have maybe dodged the covid bullet to a, to a, to a large extent um and you know maybe the 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 the, the debt issues can be uh you know we, we often think of debt in a in a somewhat kind of negative pessimistic way can we kind of pay this back it always strikes me with emerging markets that that's where the growth potential is that's where the potential is to bring these countries 
up living standards up, bring them to the technological frontier. So inherently, you might expect you know this to be a good place to to deploy debt. Um, on the other hand, I, I, the other half of me worries that the COVID shoe is is ultimately going to drop in the in the less developed de- developed world and could be quite devastating. So that, is about how COVID plays into all of this. That, that's um, that, 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 Marish, just a second. If you could keep that brief, because I want to give Karen. Um, yes, I'll be. Thirty seconds. You know the vaccination rates in emerging markets are very low, uh, and, and the ex- the potential for vari- for variants to come, and for 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 uh, uh, for the pandemic to spread wider, that remains a risk because the degree of vaccination for herd immunity is going to take a longer time, much longer time there than than in the U.S. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. This was uh, this was a great exchange. Well, thank you very much, too. And Karen, um, you were talking about a public-private partnership. You were talking about innovation. You were talking about putting resources together so that this, in the long-term uh, framework, this debt sustainability issue, can maybe better managed uh, through that kind of an approach. Uh, so please, the floor is yours uh, with a brief introduction. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, it's a pleasure, really, for me to, to attend this prestigious uh, panel and I've learned a lot so far. Uh, so who I am? Um, I live from uh, Grenoble. Uh, Grenoble is the capital of the French Alps. So I lead uh, the activities of the High Level Forum, uh, which is an international network of innovation ecosystems. Uh, by ecosystems, I mean uh, actors uh, such as uh, executives and policymakers whose role is crucial in the innovation chain. So there, there are from higher education, uh, research, technology transfer, entrepreneurship, uh, industry, business, and last but not least, uh, public uh, authorities. Uh, so where do I work? So I've been employed by the French uh, Alternative Energy and Atomic Energy Commission for uh, 26 years. Uh, with a scientific background in physics. And since uh, 2016, I've been in charge of European and international programs for its uh, technology research unit that we call CEA Tech. So to, to give you an idea of my, my playground and maybe the uh, what I will uh, promote today and my op- optimistic message. Uh, Let me say a few words uh, about my employer. Um, uh, We have, we are uh, the only government uh, research organization in France to be ranked in the uh, Darwin top uh, 100 uh, global innovators uh, 1819. Uh, Our mission is to accelerate the pace of innovation to support our national industrial economy. Uh, We make industry more competitive uh, by helping uh, it uh, develop uh, high-performance products and new solutions uh, with a huge impact on society. Um, And what else? Well, we provide, uh, we we have created and, and provided support to more than 200 startups that transform know-how and breakthrough technologies from CE Labs to the market. That's all for me and my company. But it was important for me to to, to locate, <laughs> you know, my, my playground. So I am not an economist, and and given my expertise, uh, I would like to address the, the, the second question on it. So where are the priorities for long-term debt sustainability? So maybe to summarize in my simple words the the, the question, the problem, uh, developed nations took on debt to cope with the COVID crisis. Uh, Secondly, there is a need to help developing nations uh, through debt service suspension. And Mahesh, that was very uh, important for me to do to hear you uh, describing how appalling it is at the moment, uh, you know. Uh, So, yes, this is really complicated indeed, but my message will be optimistic. Why? (laughs) In a nutshell, because I think that the crisis-related 
indebtedness of developed countries is not a long-term problem. Look, France is still standing on its feet despite a debt of uh, 120% of its GDP. And because also recovery plans set up by developed nations rely heavily on innovation. But let's, let's go further. Um, see how this crisis has stimulated scientific and technological uh, innovation of the pandemic. Then there, there were discoveries of effective uh, vaccines in record time, thanks to new technologies. Part of the credit goes to artificial intelligence, which helped uh, recreate, the, for example, the genomic sequence of the virus. Uh, another key technology is uh, in the response to the pandemic uh, is uh, 3D printing, uh, which has made it uh, possible to find solutions for medical equipment. And this is maybe the first time that the public is fully aware of the contribution of scientific and technological innovation to the promotion of human life. Um, and it is now fully agreed that investment in innovation is needed for successful post-COVID recovery. So debt must be used for this transformative power of research and innovation to accelerate the transitions that our planet and society need. And this need encompasses the entire planet, not only the, the developed country. Of course, it includes the emerging countries. So it cannot just be a question of competitiveness and competition. There must be a logic of cooperation in, in the response to the major challenges of the 21st century. And it's also crucial to, to link this to local and regional development. So uh, I say that it's good to know that those transitions are the driving force for many of the recovering plans we have uh, witnessed. Uh, the, the impact of climate change is probably the most obvious example that must benefit from trends in digital technologies. So this orientation must be seen in private, private investments, of course, uh, in addition to the public um, uh, investments in recovering plants, for example. But in the crisis, uh, it is difficult for, for private actors to not to give priority to the short term or to have the, the means to project themselves. So th there must therefore be a good synergy between the private and public sectors, and in particular, recovery plans that strengthen development infrastructures and structure innovation ecosystems that are well uh, anchored in their territories and well connected to, to each other. This is, this is the challenge uh, taken up by the high level forum. So I, I by its nature, um, this network is, is dedicated to players uh, from the public and private sector. Uh, this is a place where innovation ecosystems can learn from one another, uh, from one another and that, in my experience, in our experience, has been well used by ecosystems in regions, uh, wishing to jumpstart their innovation efforts, uh, focusing on issues of local importance, but benefiting from best practices in other regions. For example, that's true, not all territories can accommodate PV panel, uh, photovoltaic, uh, sorry, panel or electronic chip uh, factories. And current technologies are too capital intensive not to require high levels of concentration. But the challenges of uh, deployment, integration and operation of system integrating these technologies are now so complex that there is a great need for intelligence at all levels and in each territories, 
universities, research teams, uh, innovating companies are needed everywhere, including in the developing steps. Intelligence must be distributed more than ever all over the world. So if we have learned uh, something uh, in the last 20 years, it has been the creation of and consolidation around global giants, uh, particularly true when we think of innovations in the digital uh, field, but not only. Uh, so whole industries like, like uh, photovoltaic have been virtually di displaced uh, wholesale, wholesale from the roots of invention to the regions of low cost production, specifically China, uh, which uh, nevertheless has developed the technological uh, uh, pro process and uh, process and logic of ecosystem, which which to development them fully. Uh, with such dynamics, what place for emerging nations? Yes, of course. In some ways, uh, in some uh, in some cases, uh, low cost production, as we see some production moving from China and elsewhere in Asia. But even more so, so, the ability to leverage these innovations to serve local needs and drive sustainable growth. Um, another historic case, uh, case study example might be the development of mobile uh, communication networks. Uh, developing nations uh, lacked fixed um, wireline infrastructure, and it was very expensive and very slow to build out. But in effect, they jumped. 20, 30 years in communications development through their deployment of mobile networks. So, so the truism is that um, um, some, for some infrastructure investments, uh, the, the, um, it's, oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a bit lost. So, so the private, public private sectors, actors of innovation ecosystem play, play an important role in defining priority. So um, the question of debt uh, arises with a particular meaning. Can you hear an echo? Yes, the echo, echo is coming. That may be Frank doing it on purpose because we're about to end in like yeah. three minutes because I'm also getting uh, pop-ups here yeah. that the meeting is about. I was almost, yes, I was done anyway. So, uh, no, uh, thank I you. I got my uh, point because, you know, I had a lot of things to say in a few times. No, no, that's okay. And the reason, so, Karen, I mean, we talked about this before, right, in the dry runs. Yeah. I wanted to end with you because... We do need this optimism. I love yeah. hearing words collaboration, intelligence being shared. Um, the recent example of the pandemic uh, in, the, in the banking industry, right? Digitalization has picked up. So these are all good things in terms of innovation. And I think what we talked about here touched upon the various ways of dealing with debt and how to sustain it so that the macroeconomic balances can be kept. I really appreciate it. We still have some time. If you have any questions, uh, the panelists, uh, uh, one another, or... I, I, I will add a comment, if I may. Uh, I think, uh, Karen, you've done a remarkable job of explaining such a lot of things so concisely and so much to the point. I really appreciate Thank it. You. And what, what you mentioned about the jump start in Africa uh, from uh, landlines to, to mobile, that has been such a huge, huge contributor to their ability in Africa to sustain themselves through this crisis. Uh, I've had countless discussions that I worked without a hitch that with clients in Africa, which would not have worked 10 years ago. And, and it's just remarkable. And the degree of financial inclusion has expanded because companies like Mpesa created mobile money. And during the financial crisis, combined this technology with human agent banking to uh, sustain people's livelihoods when they could not be reached directly. It's been remarkable. And so science and technology is absolutely crucial for the longer term. Thank you very much. You're Absolutely. welcome. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Arun, any last uh, closing yeah, statements? Just, just to tie all this into what I was saying earlier, which is that it all depends upon how, you know, the 
uh, government of the country or the ruler looks at debt and how they use the money. So if they use the money for technology, for information equality, for dissemination, for education, for partnership, for basically doing all the right things, you know, you'll end up with a sustainable country. If you use it for buying arms or sending it to Switzerland, you will not. And uh, it's as simple as that. So whether it's the private sector or whether it's uh, the government, in the end, the touchstone is, is, is governance. I think we all know the issues. The challenge is acting upon uh, those issues in, in the right way uh, and consistently, I think. Yeah, and, and one of those countries in terms of how, um, how this issue is handled is Turkey, right? I mean, in, in terms of what not to spend it on, it could be a case study on how not to do things about that sustainability. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, anyway, that's what? just one last quick comment was that there is need for political, I would say, bipartisanism is very important. The reason you get all these high debt crises is that politicians, you know, care only for their term. They know they'll accumulate debt, let the next government deal with the mess. And, you know, this attitude of the short term attitude of really caring for your own political party for your own term, you know, that really cannot allow debt sustainability. So that's very, very fundamental. To the Absolutely. Problem. Politics and debt sustainability somehow don't go together. It, unfortunately, we have 45 minutes. I, I had so many other questions here to bring <laughs> the group together. I wanted to talk about Bitcoin and how it affects this debt sustainability in the future.